chapter 4, we're continuing, we, I mean, we're past halfway through uh, Galatians, the six verses or six chapters in Galatians. David did an awesome job last week in chapter 3, really parsing the idea uh, of the law versus the spirit. And I like the uh, illustration he used with foster parents. Uh, you know, which is very similar to what Paul used when he talked about the guardian, that the law was like a guardian and, and put in place by the father until the time come. And that it was very similar to a foster parent. You know, you know the concept of the foster parent, you tempor temporarily have the child to take care of the child until you either become the fully adopted parent or uh, an adopted parent comes in, and in our case, uh, with the illustration, uh, the law was the foster parent, and God was the adopted parent. And so now, who's our daddy? Who's our father? You know, it's, it's God, right? We don't have to deal with the, the foster system anymore, spiritually speaking. We actually have a father who does care for us, which I am very excited that I have. Let's pick up here in Galatians chapter 4. So just as we uh, continue through the journey, uh, if this is your first time uh, logging on with us, uh, Galatians is uh, what many think is the first letter uh, that Paul wrote to a church and really was the, uh, the first uh, churches, a group of churches in Asia Minor that Paul had established by planting the seeds of the gospel to those in that area. And it was four different cities that he ventured through, that he went, you know, starting from the coast and working his way up. He, he had Antioch uh, that he started in, not the Antioch uh, of Acts chapter 11 in Syria, but this is the Antioch in Galatia. So he spent time preaching the word there. And then he went over to Iconium, uh, to Lystra and Derby, sowing the seeds. But he had a lot of things go wrong. And I don't know how many how you guys last week uh, had been. But, uh, but before we start reading, uh, I had a couple days, our family had a couple days without air, air conditioning. And uh, in Texas, that's, that's not a good time, right? But I will tell you this, we built some character this week. <laughs> Me, my wife, and my two kids, we, we, we built some character this week because uh, we, uh, the, the, the problem is our air conditioning had a leak, so it still worked. Uh, it still blew, blew clear, uh, cold air, but as we had it on, it was our air conditioning on the second floor was leaking into the first floor, causing some, some water damage. So we was like, you know what? Let's turn it off into the part that we need to come in. Uh, and we're like, you know, we can go over to my parents' house and live the good life in AC. We're like, you know what? We're going to sleep here at the house. And that actually lasted two nights, uh, which, you know, better than we did when we went camping. Uh, when we only did one night there, but I will say now the AC is working uh, and uh, we had a smile with the AC working and the AC wasn't working, but our, our backs definitely were definitely different uh, depending. So we, we'll pick up here uh, in, in chapter four, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, Paul, he had a tough time when he was in Galatia. The, the persecution uh, that he endured was at each city. The persecution was still there. And he continued to do what God had called him to do and what God had called him to be. And that's definitely a, a page that we can put in our own book is that we're going to have troubles, right? You know, we, we're going to have troubles. We're going to have health issues, spiritual issues, mental issues, educational issues, academic issues. We have different things that happen. Or we're going to take a page out of Paul's book where I'm still who God has made me. And I'm going to walk the walk and talk the talk. So he writes this letter to the church. It's circulating through the church. And as we read, starting here in verse 4. Actually, let's pick up in uh, Galatians 3.26. We'll just read uh, 3.26 and read through uh, the first 11 verses of chapter 4 to get a little context. Paul says here, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees into the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of this world. But when the time had fully come, God sent the son, born of a woman, born under law to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. And we'll stop there in verse 11. So Paul, he's, as, as David had mentioned uh, last week in chapter 3, he was laying it on pretty thick with these guys. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 3, he called them foolish, and they were acting foolish. And you know you have a pretty good relationship with someone when you can call them uh, foolish, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're pretty comfortable uh, with that. But as we had mentioned last week, uh, David had painted the picture as far as the foster parent and adopted parent. And so uh, these disciples, because remember, these people are saved already. They had been adopted by God already. But what were they doing? They were being persuaded to go back to their old ways. They were persuaded to go back to their temporary guardians their temporary trustees. And Paul says something here in verse 1 and verse 7 that I thought is definitely worth looking into as you guys look at it. You know, because Paul addresses the receivers of these letters as heirs. Heirs that become sons, right? You know, I don't consider myself an heir of the Mosley family, right? Right? You know, maybe Ron considered himself an heir of the, 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 the Holly family. But a lot of times I think of heirs when it's a lot of money involved for some reason. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, when I watch movies, you know, hey, are you an heir of someone? You're like, it depends, right? You know, what, what are you going to give me? Right? If you don't give me a house, or am I going to inherit a kingdom? I'm a, am I the prince of Zamunda somewhere and I didn't even know about it, right? <laughs> so Paul is... is painting this picture for them is that you guys are heirs and God wants something more for you. He wants you to have some responsibilities that, that you guys frankly that didn't, wasn't able to comprehend before. But I asked you guys this because we're going to jump back into uh, Acts chapter 13 and get a little bit more uh, context here in a second. Do you think Paul is calling these guys heirs and uh, sons and daughters. Do you think he's addressing the whole church? You know, so you got the Gentile believers, you got the, uh, the Jewish believers. Do you think he's trying to paint this picture to help them with their Jewishness or just with their discipleship? Do you think he's trying to help them connect the dots because these people were heirs because they were Israelites or more so as they more on the slave side because they were Gentiles. And I want to get, uh, as you guys think about it, 
I want to open it up uh, for a little dialogue, but let's read here in Acts chapter 13. Put your, your finger there. In Galatians 4, we'll come back. But in Acts chapter 13 and 14, it chronicles Paul's journey through Galatia. And through the rest of Acts, he has a couple of times where he goes back and uh, he has some time uh, with the churches there, strengthening them and encouraging them. In Acts 13, 14 is when he actually planted the seeds of the gospel there. And in Acts chapter 13, verse 16, as you paint the picture there, Paul, as he customarily does, he goes to, to the synagogue and he plans to preach to the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. That was his plan, right? I'm going to go there, preach the word, and uh, see who wants to go all in for God. And really, he's thinking, hey, this is great news, right? The Messiah is here. So let's paint the picture and help these guys really get in. But here in verse 16, it says this. And this is after uh, the brothers there had said, hey, Paul, if you got any uh, message or encouragement to speak, go ahead. Acts 13, verse 16, it says, standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our fathers. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of the country. He endured their conduct for about 40 years in the desert. He overcame or overthrew seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to the people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And then he continues to kind of lay out the history of the Israelites. Helping them understand how God was in the picture all through the history from really from the beginning all the way, but he's painting the picture from Abraham on. And then you see a few years later, he writes this letter and he's talking about heirs, sons, and slaves. So I asked this question, or if you guys maybe have some thoughts. What do you think? Do you think as Paul was writing this, is he thinking of these people more from a Jewish background, Gentile background, Gentile background, that worship God, or all the above? What are some thoughts that, that come to mind? Maybe you, you read through all of Galatians or maybe read through all this. What, what, what comes to mind to you guys? Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. I feel like he's really covering all bases mm -hmm. so that he doesn't leave anything out or anything to doubt. Okay. So if, uh, for those that are online, uh, Ryan had mentioned that, okay, maybe he's just covering all bases so that whoever hears this letter, be it Jew, Gentile worshiper of God, or just a new, just a Gentile in general, they could connect to what Paul is saying. Any other thoughts, Jay? Yeah, I think it's all the above as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of chapter 3 that you read, he talks about how for you are all one in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, grouping everyone together. And then he also talks about how in Christ all the promises are yes. And then later in the chapter, he talks about the, the children of the promise are from the spiritual Jerusalem above. Mm -hmm. So it's like making a spiritual connection of mm -hmm. not based on flesh, but those who have been born again spiritually as Jesus talked about in John 3. Mm -hmm. So he's making, Paul is making that, that connection between although when I preached to you guys the first time I was making the physical connection. But I made the physical connection because it's a spiritual connection as we have inherited this promise that was given to Abraham and it's finally come to fruition through Jesus Christ. So it don't matter if you was Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. All of us can really look at this promise and say, we're heirs now. I don't have to have a last name Holly or Abbott. I don't have to have a last name of Mosley or Cardi. If my faith and walk is in Jesus, now I'm a son of God. Right, so that's a really cool thing that Paul was really trying to paint the picture of, right? 
is that you guys are heirs and you're trying to go back to things that are just not spiritual. And he makes this, and you can flip back, and thank you guys for your comments. I think it really helps provide some color to what we're reading here. One of the other things that really stuck out to me on this first little part of Galatians chapter 4 is Paul talking about this concept of basic principle. You guys, uh, was it in verse 2? Uh, what did it say? Verse 2, is that verse 3? Verse 3, he says, So also when you were children... We were in slavery under what? The basic principles or maybe even the elemental principles, depending on which, which Bible translation that you have. And that was an interesting concept because this elemental principle, I'm like, okay, is he talking about the law as one of those principles? Is he talking about just the basic principles, the, the, the carnal part of our world, the, the tangible things that we can touch? And looking at the, the Greek word that Paul used, is uh, stoikion, stoikion. And if you're online or even for you guys that are here, we do got the notes uploaded for chapter four that will break some of this down that you guys can go back and reference and add your own notes to. And that's uh, available through our DFW Church app uh, in the sermon notes section for chapter four, or chapter three and four, which cons consolidates together. But you got this concept of stoikion, and what is really directed to is that the, the elemental principles are the worldly principles. And it talks that these, these are the things, and, and Paul uses this term three or four other times, and Peter actually uses this term a couple times uh, in his second letter to disciples. And what, he, what Peter ended up using it for is that these elemental principles, these basic principles are going to be part of the things that burn up when Jesus comes back. These are going to be the things that are going to be no more, that they have no value when it comes to eternal looking, when it comes to spiritual view, as you guys had made the connection earlier. Paul is not just talking physical, but spiritual as he's talking to these guys. And he says, you guys are turning to the basic principles of this world. And we can see contemporary times is that it's very easy for us to fall in line with the elemental and the basic principles of this world. Where the tangible things end up being our God, our jobs, our houses, our safety. Those things take, take precedent over God, faith, trust. And Paul is, is the poster boy between the difference between the spiritual world and the physical world. Because if, if I was his homeboy, if I was going on the journeys that he was going through, I'm like, Paul, I don't know if you noticed that riot that's outside, but it's here because of you. Or it's here because of us, because of what we're preaching. Paul was like, hey, man, it's, it's time to preach the word. I'd be like, you know what? Let's go over to uh, Frisco. You know, let's, let's go preach in Frisco. I don't think they're riding there, right? Paul was like, no. God has sent me to preach the word. I'm here until I'm not here anymore. And you think about that concept for us now. Who is, what, what are situations that God is trying to send you into? Who are people that God are, is trying to send you to? Maybe it's specific people that you work with. And I was pretty cool. Uh, three months ago before our COVID hit, uh, me and Ron Holly, we were talking about a, a co-worker friend of his that he's had a relationship for years. And just what it's like when you have that window with someone and you just throw the seeds in there, right? Sometime they reciprocate and they're like, you know what? I want to take this journey of faith and, and sometimes they're just not ready. But the real question is not, are they ready? It's are we, right? Are we going to let them know what God has done in our life? And that's something that Paul was painting the pictures like, hey guys, you guys are trying to go back to these elemental, these basic principles, these things that's going to burn up as Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3, 
He says, these things are going to burn up. You're trying to hold on to them. Don't let the circumcision party, don't let the Jewish party, don't let these guys take you away from your father who has adopted you. Because God saw something in you that is not just during your earthly time, but also for eternity in heaven. And that's an a awesome picture that God is really trying to paint for them. Amen. But that's not just for them. That's for us, right? Paul paints that picture for them, but this, that is a truth for us as well. But one of the things that they were struggling on as we continue to read here in verse 12 is listening to man over God, but also struggling with things that were tangible versus things that was intangible. Let's pick back up in verse 12. We read verse 12 through 20. Paul says this, I plead with you, brothers, become like me, for I became like you. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. I guess that maybe that was his illness, right? Something maybe dealing with the eye, but it, in Acts it doesn't talk about it. He specifically doesn't say it here. Verse 16, I have now become your enemy by telling you the truth. Before I continue to read, it's almost like Paul is setting them up, right? He's like, when I came to you, I was an angel. I was almost like Christ Jesus. And now verse 16, I'm an enemy to you. You're like, what happened? Right? You know, you, you think about relationships where it was like that. You're like, man, we used to be boys. We used to be girls. I don't know if girls call it like that the same. But, you know, we used to be boys. And now, am I an enemy? And am I an enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Sometimes we lose friendships because we tell the truth, right? And it's tough. And it makes you sometimes want to think, okay, do I need to be telling the truth? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes, we still do. Even if we lose some relationships, even if we lose some friendships temporarily, because we want those friendships to not be the elemental principles, right? that will burn up. We want that friendship to be one of the spiritual principles of this world that when, when everything burns that we're in heaven. And the truth is that line that helps our friends cross that line from the elemental to the spiritual. So let's not give up speaking the truth, amen. amen. Right? Let's make sure we have it seasoned with salt and some <laughs> gentleness in there and some kindness. But Make sure that it's still got the meat in there, the truth. Amen. Keep uh, reading here in verse 17. It says, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. It is fine to be zealous, right? Provided the purpose is good. And to be so always and not just when I am with you. And Paul uses this enduring term, right, in verse 19. He says, my dear children, from whom I am again in pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. I mean, you can feel the emotion that Paul is trying to write and in ink in this letter. And he's trying to be like, man, I'm, I'm not physically with you right now. But guys, I hope you can feel my love and my concern. Because he says, I am perplexed with you. I don't know when the last time somebody said that to you. But typically, it's not a good situation when they say that, right? They're like, you know what? I'm perplexed with you, Clint. They're like, all right, I need to sit down and listen, right? <laughs> I need you to sit down and listen and figure out what, what just happened. That you're perplexed with me. That it's like a puzzle and I just can't put it together, right? But it's interesting that in verse 19, 
we kind of work our way back up. He says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is born. You know, Paul is making this metaphor of birth. And this is a man, right? And last I checked, man, we don't have children. Right? And I'm, and I'm glad for it, amen. But Paul, he's, what is he talking about? He's in pain. Because he was like their spiritual father, right? He introduced them to the gospel. And he was like, you know what? You guys accepted the truth. You know, if we go back to Acts chapter 13, at the end of Acts chapter 13, you know, he preached the word. He made that connection from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to Moses all the way through the kings. And now we have Jesus. This Messiah that all the Old Testament is about. This promise has come to fruition. So he preaches his word, and, and guess what? Everybody there in the synagogue, it was like, you know what? This is, this is great, right? Remember who was in the synagogue? It was the Jews that were in the tradition of the Old Testament. It was the God-fearing Gentiles. So those are the ones that was listening. That was his audience in the synagogue. And Paul impressed them. I mean, I could see them even thinking similar to when Jesus preaches. Like, man, this guy, he preaches with authority. He's making connections that the rest of these Pharisees, these rabbis, these teachers are just not making. And they were excited. And they was like, man, Paul, can you come back next week? You know, next Saturday, can you come and preach more about this topic? So if you were Paul, you're like, okay, yeah, things are going well. This, this birthing process spiritually is moving along, right? Because these people are getting closer and closer. And then fast forward to that next week, he preaches again, and guess who's there? It says almost like the whole town was there. And you guess who would be in that? So now, it's probably not just Jews and God-fearing Gentiles. But it's probably just regular Gentiles in there now, right? Because they heard, they're like, okay, they probably, they couldn't come into the inner courts, but they could hear from the outer courts. And they're like, all right, let's 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 hear what this guy's about. Because my Jewish friend or my, my Greek friend, who's a God worshiper, he told me about this guy, and I want to I want to show up and figure out what it is, what, what it's about, right? At least for a good show. So Paul preaches again. And guess what ended up happening? The same guys that he's talking about right now, this same group, the circumcision group, they were jealous. They were jealous of what God was doing through Paul. And because of that, you have to remember, Paul was new to the area. They had been there for how many years, how many generations? So they were able to persuade those that were coming to faith to go back to their old ways. And I know we can all relate to that. You become a disciple. You get baptized. You're, you're, you're trying to, to live life like God has, has created you. You're trying to be his son. You're trying to be his daughter. You're trying to be a person of faith. But then someone else that you knew, they try to come drag you back. They're like, you, may, you don't need to go to church every Sunday. I mean, like it's, it's not even every Sunday anymore. It's not even about the meeting. Man. You, it seemed like you talk to those, those, those Christian folks every day. I thought Sunday was enough. I thought Wednesday was enough. And then you start thinking, you know, I, I think Sunday is enough. I, I think Wednesday is enough. Right? That's two days out of the week. That's more than what a lot of people do. Because they're trying to to dissuade you from who you are. As we began in chapter 4, it says you are sons and daughters. Last time I checked, I'm a son and son of my mother and my father every day of the week, not just Sunday and Wednesday, mm -hmm. right? It's not something I put on and take off. You're like, okay, I'm a son right now, and now I'm not. <laughs> That's sometimes what our friends, our contacts, our family even sometimes. 
They try to persuade us that, hey man, what you're doing is enough. Like, no, I have been bought, right? We have been bought. Christ has bought us with his blood so that now we're sons, now we're daughters of God. Amen? Amen. And they were struggling with this. And sometimes we struggle with our identity because a lot of times we find our identity in what we do as opposed to who we are, right? Okay, long as I'm doing this, long as I'm, I'm helping somebody or uh, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this or I'm helping the poor, I'm doing all, which these are awesome things. But Paul was pleading in these six chapters of Galatians that you have been bought. It don't matter if you're slave or free. It don't matter if you're Greek or Jew. The price has been paid. So now go live your life like the price has been paid because it has. So he's, he's painting this picture. And he's like, These, this circumcision party, they're struggling with the tangible. And I can understand, my wife and I, we were talking this morning about the concept of almost battle wounds sometimes. Battle wounds and really traditions too. It kind of made me start thinking about traditions. About how when you go through something, y'all remember that movie um, um, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson? Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon. Y'all remember, I can't remember if it was the first, the first movie or not, and they started uh, comparing battle wounds. You know, I got this one from this, I got this one from this, I got this from a girlfriend, a boyfriend, you know, you're like, they're doing all these different things. And they're comparing the battle wounds. And I can imagine that the circumcision party, they're like, you know what? We've been doing this for our whole life. We've been doing this since, since forever. And now this guy Paul is preaching. And he wasn't preaching that, hey, you Jews need to stop what you're doing. He was preaching that I've seen the connection. What has been preached for generations is finally here and the Messiah is here and now our generation, we get to see what our forefathers were only promised. And then they started resting on those traditions. They were resting on their circumcision. They're like, man, hey, if we went through it, you got to go through it, right? And I can understand that one, right? He's like, hey, man, if I got through this pain, hey, you got to go too, bro, <laughs> right? We don't want the discipleship light. But that's not what Paul was talking about. He was saying, your circumcision is not what saved you. Your quote-unquote tradition is not what saved you. It's walking with God. It's walking now with Christ. And one of the things I love about what, what he really shows is that I could feel, and I don't know if you guys too, you could feel the thread of love even as he's challenging their thoughts challenging their perspectives. And that's the question is us as disciples. Is that when we see something in someone and the truth is not in them, the truth is not what they're living out, do we still keep the thread of love all the way through? Yes. yes. Love, concern. Like the reason I'm bringing this up is not because I'm fed up, not because I'm frustrated. And sometimes that's, that's how a disciple is out of frustration. And out of anger. He's like, no, I'm doing this because of concern, because you're losing part of your identity. And I want to help you get your identity back into Christ. And then he ends, this last little portion of it, he, he, he uses a metaphor between Hagar and Sarah. You know, these are both uh, women attached to uh, Abraham. You know, which where the promise was promised through Abraham, right? You know, talked about some in, uh, in Genesis 3, but really came to, to a definition through Abraham, right, of the promise that the rest of the world will be blessed through Abraham's seed. And let's wrap up here in verse 21. Uh, actually, somebody give me a time. I got my phone up here. What time is it? 940. Thank you. All right. 
So here in verse 21 of Galatians chapter 4, it says, Tell me, you who want to be under law, are you not aware of what the law says? And that's a pretty pointed question, right? Mm. <laughs> For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. His son by his slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the, one, the women represent two covenants. One covenant is with Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free. And she is our mother, for it is written, Be glad, O barren woman, who bears no children. Break forth and cry out loud, you who have no labor pains. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, you brothers, like Isaac, are children of a promise. At that time, the son born in the ordinary way, which was Ishmael, persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit, which was Isaac. It is the same now. The same thing is happening. But what does the scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son would never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So Paul uses this story. He goes back to, you know, Genesis. It says, okay, y'all remember Hagar. Y'all remember Sarah. And these are disciples, so even though they had a Gentile background, they probably were starting to hear more about the Israelite history that God was, was, was taking the Israelites to, right? So even the Gentiles are probably hearing these stories at this point. And he says that you got the ordinary birth and you got the, the children of the promise. And sometimes we find more solace over here. The ordinary. And we know Sarah did, right? Because it was Sarah's idea for Abraham to have a child with Hagar, right? Even though the promise was given to God, she was like, okay, I, I need to do things how I know how to do things. And sometimes, when it comes to promises, I could feel that same way, right? Let me just do what I know I should do. Let me just do these different things, and I forget about the faith aspect. I forget about scriptures like Matthew 6, 33, where it says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I was challenged by that when the AC went out this week, right? I was like, Lord, am I seeking you? Should I have AC? He's like, I wasn't talking about that guy. Go back and read chapter 6. What it, you have a roof over your head, you have food, you have clothes. Yeah. Right? You know, I was hoping that AC was somewhere in that degree, but it, it wasn't there, right? <laughs> but these promises... That's why it's so important, and I, I'm challenged, because a lot of times I, I forget some of the promises that God has told me. And I forget to live based off those promises. Paul was really laying it on thick with these guys, like, okay, let me, let me give you an illustration. Kind of in closing, as I mentioned, we, we got more uh, that you can see uh, through the church app you know, going through one of the things I thought was interesting was this concept of how useful could the law, because the law, remember, the law is not bad in, its, in and of itself. They were using it in a bad way. They was using it for salvation where the law, it was meant to keep them on the straight and narrow until Jesus came. The law was to help them to receive blessings too, Right? Because we read in Deuteronomy, we read in Exodus that, hey, if you do these things, you will be blessed. And it also helped with the concept is that they were going into a land 
of people who were faithless. They were going into a land of the Canaanite, the Israelites. They were going into a place where God knew that when you go here, they're going to persuade you to be like them. So I'm going to give you these laws, these commands, these statutes. So when it comes to what they're doing versus what I tell you to do, you're going to choose what I tell you to do. And I'm going to be very descriptive on what that is. So it wasn't bad in itself. They were just using it in the bad way. And one of the things that is on the notes of the app is this concept of how useful would the law have been if they would have had it between Abraham and Moses? How useful would it have been? Right? And it's just speculation in there, but uh, I have a couple bullet points in there that y'all can look at that I think would be pretty cool to look at. But as we conclude here, the question that I give out to you guys is do you see yourself in the Galatian disciples in any way? Do you see, be it in the conversation of faith, the elemental versus the spiritual, the promise versus the tangible, the maybe even speaking the truth in love or not speaking the truth because you might lose a, a relationship. Do you see yourself in the Galatian disciples in any way? And as we continue to go, we're going to take a quick break here. You know, next week we'll focus on, on chapter 5. Uh, and we may even do chapter 5 and chapter 6 because they, the, the themes are, are very similar. But as you guys continue to, to contemplate and chew on Galatians 4, and one of the things that I'll throw out to you guys as you, as you meditate on chapter 4 this week is every day reading through the chapter and just read it in different versions. You know, you might read it in the New Living Trans Translation one, one day and then maybe the ESV another day. Maybe the message version in one day and maybe the, the New American Standard another day and just get different ways to hear God's word in. Okay. But also to venture back into Acts chapter 13 and 14 to see what the environment was like when Paul planted that church. Because that will give us great connections as we read this letter and connect it to what was happening back then. So let's end our time in prayer. We'll get a, a couple moments to uh, fellowship uh, before we start the virtual service. So thank you guys for getting on this journey in Galatians. It's God's word. It's chock full of goodness if we take the time to jump in and write. And thank you guys for, for being here online, for being here in person. Uh, let's pray, and then um, we'll have a quick break. And thank you guys for, for joining in online. Dear Heavenly Father, as we uh, continue our, our time, we thank you for uh, joining us through Galatians chapter 4. That we can see that for, for disciples of Jesus, that part of that is we're sons and daughters of you. And I pray that we never sell our birthright, that we never trade that status of being your heir, of being your son, and being your daughter. I thank you for the truths that we, we got to dig out uh, in this chapter and, and through Acts and, and in different ways as we journey through your word. And I pray that uh, as we go throughout this week, that this will be part of our DNA, that we meditate on your word, that we understand it so that we can live it out so we can be the sons and daughters you've created us to be. We thank you again for technology. We thank you uh, for continually to leading us in the life that you give us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus.